fasting labs. <laughs> For others, it might be what? A narcotic. Right? And so I've even tried, I was told I shouldn't do it, to tell patients they need a mammogram and they need a pap smear. So I had a patient come in, she did, but then I was told you really shouldn't do that. I said, why not? But it, so it does work to actually say that I will actually, in addition to what it's for, if the patient actually needs the, uh, needs fasting labs or needs the blood work, their, you know, sodium, potassium, creatinine, or fasting lipids, at the beginning, I'll put fasting labs due before next refill, then the take one every evening for cholesterol. And so some patients don't read it, so then we send them messages and things, and my nurse knows me. She's like, oh, here's Mrs. Bogan again. She hasn't done her labs yet. You have it on there. Call her and let her know. I didn't know that. They're not reading the labels because it is on there. They're not reading the labels. So I know with pharmacy, we set up, the patient can ask for counseling, and I don't know your numbers on that, but I'm thinking a majority don't get it, but to actually read those labels. So we're going to end with this. I love quotations. Again, all of these slides, I kind of go back in time and pull them out to put this together. So Donna Harrison, I have this uh, leadership book that I picked up at the airport. I'm not sure where I was, but I picked it up. And this is kind of how I describe us as leaders, right? We really have this innate enthusiasm and passion for what we do. So I know I was a little soft-spoken today. I know I, you know. <laughs> However, this is, in case you cannot tell and that didn't come out, it's not just about the patients that come to see me. It's treating patients as if they were my family and how it's what we learned in kindergarten. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And how would you want that family member to be treated and how would you encourage your family member to take their medications to have those better outcomes? Okay. That's it. Questions and thank you. And I do have one other thing. One thing I do is uh, I did travel carry. I went to carry on luggage yesterday morning. So I'm going to go back. Well, I would have gone back later until I made a purchase last night. So I brought uh, all of those handouts with me and the articles. And what we I did in. I think it was 2013 and Kaiser Permanente, we have a service form. Not everybody is born with, it's like, man, I don't know if you've ever run into anybody. <laughs> Not everyone is born with that, right? The service. And so we had a speaker come in and Rich Bluni, B-L-U-N-I, is a nurse that now is on the speaker circuit about bedside manner and providing great service, right? And touching the patients being there with the patient, eye level, sitting, exact, all of that. And so he actually said, for us to be thankful for where we are at the moment. And so, if, you know, we might have a busy day, a patient may have passed away, complications, etc., untoward events. He said to be thankful. So he actually showed a slide with a yellow car. So how many of you see yellow cars out on the road? We do, but not as many as apparently now. White is the new favorite color of cars. And so he asked us to look for yellow cars, and he asked us, when we see a yellow car, in our minds, to state something we're thankful for. And so I actually started that over, well, at this point, probably over two years ago, and I do that with my kids. And there's some days where you see three, five, 15 cars, and they're like, enough, Mom. But they'll come up with, they're thankful that they had breakfast, whatever they wanted for breakfast that school's over that day, or that they, you know, we'll even say they have a roof over their head, or they're thankful we're going out to dinner, or they're getting new back to school shoes. And so, in my uh, expression of thanks for Elaine and Rebecca, I brought yellow cars. So you two, you two, uh, now you may know Rebecca and Elaine, who do you think's a Porsche, and who do you think is a sand stinger, that would ride the uh, outdoor four-wheel <laughs> ATV. So, I have so uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you all. And now, thank you. We have time for questions. Oh. So people have questions for.
for Ray. Thank you, Ray, especially for the yellow card. Sure. And wait for the mic, please, just because we want to make sure we can record it. Thank you. Thank you. Barb, Barbara Hanna with Home and Health Care Management. You showed a slide that um, showed that you had a blip up in your blood pressure rates, and it was like during, uh, maybe after, do you know why? Do you know what caused that or what potentially it usually could have created that? The time of year. So, what tends to happen? And do, great pickup. See, she likes graphs and things. Great pickup, attention to detail. So, do you notice that trend was uh, the fall? How many of you see that? Because that actually is a whoops, I did it again. That is actually a trend in Kaiser that at the end of the year, control rates will go down, and then we start off the year increasing them. So it's the year-end drop. Thanksgiving, Halloween, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas. So we try, and Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa. And I'm missing others. I mean, no disrespect, it's just the holidays that come towards the end of the year. And patients are not concerned about their health towards the end of the year. And then what do people do in January? I have a New Year's resolution. <laughs> I'm going to start taking my meds, right? So that actually occurs with diabetes as well. We see that. So great pickup. Any other questions? <laughs> Yeah, hi, uh, Kirby Lee, uh, um, you know, I really appreciate both of your presentations because I think you've um, had successful interventions because you employed some of the uh, topics that we discussed this morning. So Dr. Zillig mentioned the continuum of care. Yes. In your case, starting off with getting the right prescription right. and then dealing with all the issues throughout persistence. Uh, and Joan, I think you, you talked about, um, uh, well, both of you talked about meeting patients in their setting, in their community. And I think Dr. Kaufman mentioned that, you know, it's the local culture, it's the local interventions that are going to be most successful using face-to-face -face engagement and interaction. Uh, so I really appreciate both of you really targeted, in your case, African Americans, uh, in your case, Hispanics, but that you actually understood their barriers and worked around their issues. Right. Thank you. Another couple more? Go ahead. Oh, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Imperial Pro Sacramento Valley Pharmacists Association. Um, the first thing I'd say is the people that live in New York with all the yellow cabs must be really, really great. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, when my husband was actually, I wouldn't say commuting, but he was doing some training at UCSF. And so he is one of the surgeons that I talk about. And so he was doing some training at UCSF. So I would go to the airport on Friday and then go back again Sunday. Oh, that was, I said, wait a minute, there's too many yellow cars. <laughs> yes. Uh, you described very, very uh, eloquently the Kaiser experience. And Kaiser, by definition, is basically a closed system. Yes. And, uh, and, and Kirby just sort of alluded to this too. To make this, to make this uh, effective, this uh, improved community health of the triple aim, uh, we're going to have to move it out into the community, which is by definition a non-closed system. It's wide open. Correct. And, uh, and by having your closed system, you have certain uh, leverages over your uh, employees, if you will, the physician, the pharmacists, the nurses, to do things sort of the Kaiser way. Without that same leverage in the community, what would you, what strategy would you suggest uh, that we start to investigate, to employ, to get the community more involved and to provide these level of services, hopefully with the same patient outcomes that you're describing? Great question, and the answer comes from Elaine and from Rebecca. It's events like this, campaigns like the Script Your Future, it's the Right Care Initiative. I know Hattie had to step out to go to another meeting. It's all of those types of things because as you were saying, Kaiser is a closed system as far as patients. However, I come to you today speaking with PowerPoints and things. However, I go into the community and I speak at churches. I speak to students at high schools. And so when I go out into the community, I speak at businesses. 
One day I even led a mindfulness of all things. I led a mindfulness event, but was able to incorporate blood pressure, exercise, cholesterol, speaking as we were doing all of that. And so I go out into the community and there are others within Kaiser because we do have the, we used to call it public affairs, public relations, it's community benefits, governmental affairs now. They actually do go out into the community and we uh, participate. And it's all of us coming together with a multidisciplinary, the pharmacist. One thing here that is missing that I always do go back to is the um, faith-based organizations. So in S S Southeast San Diego, more of the Hispanic and African American population. And so we actually are starting, there's the American Heart Association, Kaiser gave a grant to the American Heart Association, and they're working in Atlanta and in San Diego on African American hypertension. So even though Kaiser is the grant, it, it gave the grant, it's not internal Kaiser. There have the patients that are joining that initiative and participating are in the community. And it's all of us working with the pharmacists, faith-based church organizations. Liz is shaking her head. That's how we started in San Diego, where all of the community is involved. And having the faith-based organizations, especially in the African-American community, when the minister says it, the pastor says it, they it's literally like gospel. And it does uh, help implement change. I see three more questions. So oh, do we have time for that? Oop. No. Okay. Oh, Marcella wanted to add some. Wait. I know that we're having with community-based organization. I'm thinking about um, like the alliance we work with a network of community agencies that already provide services at the community level. So doing partnerships with them, you know, you already have the cultural um, um, experience, the language issues, so you don't have to bring back the wheel. Right. So Kaiser, for example, partnering with community agencies would be the best way to... Um, and that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. Okay, Ray, and then... Okay. Uh, Ray Bowman. Hi, Ray. I'm Ray. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm with the National Council on Patient Information and Education. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. I may have misunderstood you or misheard you. Um, I heard that you include indications on the on the SIG for the patient? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm interested and curious about that. I know that uh, Dr. Gordon Schiff from Brigham and Women's has, I believe it's an ARC three-year funded study to look at the uh, inclusion of indications on the computer uh, ordered entry uh, yes. systems. And uh, was how did you achieve that? I mean, internally, was that, that seems to be a big win over the legal side of things. Um, well, we have the electronic health that. records, and just as we heard, the, some people may say it's too much on there if there were any opposing you know, parties. However, they're smart sets. So if you order Prinzide, what I do if the patient's already been on the medication, I've added it in, so when they request the refill, then it's already there. And so I just started years ago adding it in. Interestingly, I had a patient come in just recently, which means the past two to four weeks, and she had her thyroid medicine. And she said, no, what is this one for? Because it doesn't say what it's for. And I realized, well, I know Levothroid has thyroid kind of in it, but I changed it in the system. She didn't need to pick up the prescription, so I put it into file, so it'll be there. And now it will say, you know, as thyroid supplement. So, and so it's in the system and when they get the refills, right. that's what comes up. And even if the patients get their medicine outside Kaiser, all of the orders are in the computer, so it will remain and we just print off. So uh, I guess my question speaks to the privacy concerns ah. of, of patients and what the implications of having that out in the indications out in the real world. Well, again, the medication bottle has identifying information. So I would presume they're not holding the prescription, you know, somewhere, you know, sitting at the grocery store, or, you know, at a ball game or something like that. However, and so most patients really do like it. And now what I'm seeing at, with our population aging is the children like it. So the children taking care of their 70, 80 year old parents, they know what it's for. And then when you get the caregivers in there, so a lot of different uh, caregivers for one patient, they all know what the medication is for and that grandma can't say she doesn't want it. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ray. I oh. think we've um, kind of run out of time okay. for questions, but I know Ray will be available for yes. um, more questions. So let's give her another round oh, of applause. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. But oh, and I do want to say, Ray, you have additional resources. I up here do. Too. So I do. Feel free to uh, pick these up, and you can also right. contact Ray as well. I know you have a lot. So of I have resources. a couple where they're do you know blood pressure month is in May, so English and Spanish. So that is one thing we do translate many of the patient information handouts to uh, the what are they the big five I guess with English, Spanish, Mandarin, Tagalog down in San Diego, and I'm missing one. I'm not sure if it's Russian with the population. So I brought some of those in uh, different languages. Ray, thank Thanks. you, Ray. So thank you guys all for taking the time to be here today. I'm really impressed. Um, and I wish I could have joined you. Ironically, after uh, Elaine issued the invitation to me to do this, I looked at my calendar and realized I had a conflict I have an all-day board meeting that I uh, am attending, and the irony of it is it's in the building next door. <laughs> so I, we, we could not have organized this on a bet very easily. Um, so uh, I would have been here were that not the case. I am really genuinely especially pleased to introduce your next speaker. Um, he is my state senator, among other attributes. That one's a minor attribute. Uh, but before I introduce Dr. Pan, I want to, anytime I get near a microphone, I, I want to have, have a little platform to say just a few words. Um, and they are part of my introduction. Um, medication management or adherence is one of the foundations of really good coordinated care. Um, when I talk to some folks outside this room, you all get this, but you know, I try to explain to people it doesn't do good to worry and spend a lot of time about language access. Uh, it doesn't do uh, much good to worry about timely access to appropriate treatment. Uh, it doesn't do a lot of good to worry about affordable health care if and at the end of the day that health care focuses on medications and the patients don't take the medications. And I know that's obvious to all of you. It's not that obvious to the broader, uh, the broader public. So I really admire uh, those of you who are engaged in this issue because this is where the rubber meets the road for people to get the medications that they need to either be stable or to improve their health care. Um, it's more than that, though, from my point of view. Our organization has been heavily committed to promoting coordinated care for our population, for seniors, uh, and to a lesser extent, we work with people uh, with disabilities. Uh, coordinated care, and I use that term broadly, it encompasses a new state initiative on health homes, it's part of uh, managed care, uh, and certainly the new Cal Connect dual eligibles project. It, it is what I think California has taken the great leap and concluded that coordinating people's care, especially high acuity people, just has benefits all the way around. Of course, our Department of Finance looks at the benefits in terms of the potential savings. We haven't seen them yet, but uh, at any rate. So, um, so we are really supported and, and it's, to me, one of his greatest attributes that Richard Pan has been at the forefront of promoting all of the reforms in healthcare in California, and they have been huge. In the, in the period of time that he's been uh, actively involved in public life. Uh, he and in his life, he uh, has been a professor uh, uh, with a very distinguished educational background. So uh, he brings that knowledge to you today. He's been uh, 
He's focused a lot on medical workforce challenges, uh, which is something we worry a great deal about, not only uh, for specialty care, but for general care. A lot of docs are getting old. He's not yet. He's a long way from it. Um, and uh, he's been a practicing physician. As a public official, he has been as concerned about old people, people I lobby for, as well as kids that he has his practice in. And uh, he's also, as I suspect you all know from reading newspapers from time to time, he has been responsible for promoting what we believe uh, is some really essential, important legislation in California. So. He's a good friend for seniors. I hope uh, that uh, you guys have, been, I know you guys somewhere along the line have been touched by his work and his practice. And it's my enormous privilege to introduce Dr. Richard Pan, State Senator. Thank you, Gary. Thank you so very much. And it's uh, great to be here with all of you today. And I want to really, again, um, Gary's uh, past more than the uh, California Congress of Seniors has been a very important advocacy group and fighting for seniors and being sure we have a better health care system. And I know that that's what we're all here uh, together to do. So uh, I've been asked to uh, actually first uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the uh, policy issues that, are, that uh, touched the Capitol since uh, last Friday was the end of session. So now all the bills that have made it are to the governor's desk. And, and then also touch a bit about also as well uh, the, the work that, uh, that, that we are all trying to do together to improve medication adherence. Uh, so probably the biggest thing for this past year for me was uh, vaccination. So uh, and uh, actually trying to increase vaccination rates uh, as we uh, struggled to deal with actually numerous outbreaks of vaccine preventable diseases over the past several years. In 2010, we had a large pertussis outbreak in the state of California where 10 infants died. Of course, we had the outbreak of measles and uh, from that began in Disneyland uh, last, uh, it began last uh, December and then spread across the state. And clearly that was a sign that unfortunately in this case, in, ter in terms of vaccination, um, because of misinformation and um, that's been spread about vaccinations that unfortunately too many of our communities had low vaccination rates that allowed the spread of, of, of disease and that state need to step up to be sure that we protect the most vulnerable in our communities because there are people who can't get vaccinated, people with chronic conditions who may be treated for cancer or received a transplant or are allergic to, to, to vaccines and they depend on the rest of us to stay vaccinated. So I'm um, proud to have worked with my joint author, uh, Senator Ben Allen, who is a former school board member, to work to be sure we keep our kids vaccinated. And really, it's about protecting the entire community. So while we're talking about children and school entry, it's about pre pre protecting our community. And again, as we're trying to figure out what we can try to do in terms of prevention and uh, reducing the spread of disease, at least let's, uh, and we've been facing a lot of different uh, infectious diseases as well as other conditions as well. Think about, uh, uh, less, if you think, just go back a year ago, everyone was worried about Ebola. Although, frankly, there was not a single case of Ebola that was spread in the general population in the United States. Yet everyone was uh, certainly expressing concern. We had uh, a uh, enterovirus infection uh, that seemed to cause, send kids to the intensive care unit. Um, um, and we had a flu season last summer that uh, actually, unfortunately, took away the lives of too many uh, adults who were actually previously healthy and um, and we're still struggling with things such as valley fever, West Nile virus and others. So when we have diseases where we actually have a vaccination and we actually have a way to prevent it, uh, one would think that we would go ahead and take the steps we need to be sure we protect our communities. Now, of course, vaccinations are wonderful and they're, they're great, but uh, we also, uh, there's other medications we need to be sure people get access to and as a uh, physician and someone who, and when I was chair of the Assembly Health Committee while I was serving the Assembly, worked very hard to implement the Affordable Care Act. But what we knew is we were implementing the ACA in the first phase, we were mainly working on the coverage pieces, but that we recognized that very quickly we would need to deal with the access because we have, we reduced the number of uninsured by half. And that's very exciting news. We've reduced an uninsured in California by half in one year. 
Now they have insurance. Yes, thank you. I heard some applause there. But now that they have coverage, the question is, do they have access? And what kind of access do they have? And so the ACA did put in many different protections, uh, you know, ensured that people didn't have lifetime caps so they wouldn't run out of the coverage, uh, limited uh, their uh, out-of-pocket costs based on their income, although still you know, amounts that people would still struggle with, but uh, put some caps. But we also recognize that uh, people with particularly chronic conditions, people particularly who depended on more recent drugs, biologics, were facing a tremendous dilemma because the way it was structured, you essentially had to figure out how to pay thousands of dollars out of pocket, essentially up to your maximum before you got any help from your coverage. And since the percentage for your maximum is based on the sort of the concept that this would be spread out, you know, this would not be something you'd put up all up front, it's hard to suddenly find thousands, you know, that percentage of your income so quickly. And, uh, and so I'm glad that uh, many of my colleagues, and I'm proud to have supported them, took uh, work to try to address this issue. Uh, this year, Assemblymember Gordon and Atkins, and Assemblymember Gordon's been working on this for a while. We now have a bill, uh, AB 339, on the governor's desk that's going to uh, limit the uh, put copayment caps and uh, $250 and $500 uh, for, for, for medication. That's also going to uh, be sure that health plans don't discourage enrollment of individuals' health conditions in terms of their coverage. Uh, we're glad that Covered California took some steps as well. And so hopefully we will, you know, we'll be working to be sure to have the governor sign that. Uh, but we want to be sure we, again, put some protection, some additional protections in. And then also uh, AB 374 by Assembly Nazarian, uh, steps therapy. And I'll tell you as a physician, um, on one hand, I certainly understand the plan saying too many doctors perhaps just quickly write for a particular brand name. But on the flip side, and too many patients know this, you know, you've worked with your doctor, you identified the right medication, the health plan changes, and they tell you to start all over again. You already know what works and what doesn't work Right? And there needs to be a way to not make patients actually lose ground. Have them lose ground to use medications that are not the most effective for them or have excessive side effects when you know which one works. And so uh, this bill will put in a process for that. So uh, again, on the governor's desk, and we hope that we can encourage the governor to sign those. Now, I'm proud to have been involved with Script Your Future uh, from the beginning. Can you say the beginning? 2012, yes, because I know how important uh, adher medication adherence is. I mean, it's a $500 billion savings opportunity. It costs us, medi poor medication adherence costs us half a billion dollars in the United States. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and uh, the other, challenges is that um, you know, we, a lot of times what happens is that in the medical field, we used to call it the patient was non-compliant, right? But when I was a residency director, and we said, no, 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 you, don't, you can't say the patient was non-compliant, right? Because when you see a patient, we prescribe them something, see them again, you take your medication, oh, then you know, for whatever reason isn't taking the medication. And so the resident would come back and present patient, right, and say, you know, so-and-so, we saw them last time, uh, and this time they're, they're, they're non-compliant with the treatment plan, with the, the prescription I gave, and, so, and, and said, no, it's not compliance, because we know that there are many reasons why people don't take their medication, right? And it's not because necessarily they don't want to. There may be financial barriers. There may be side effects that they haven't shared with the physician. There, and certainly this program is about trying to educate people to not only speak up, but also share with their physician, their pharmacists, and you know, and many ways we need to uh, figure out how we build a better system of care because our pharmacists have a very critical role to play, and in many ways I think in the community, um, 
when I was in the hospital, we had pharmacists around with us, and so we were able to, but out in the community, the integration between pharmacists and physicians, we need to build better connections there, right? And, and uh, the pharmacists can play a really critical role in improving medication adherence. Uh, in many ways, uh, as the patient goes and not only fills the prescription, but whether refills or even communication in between. And so there's a lot of work that we can do there. Uh, to do that, and I'm um, pleased that we actually have a law here in California that's to, to help promote this kind of connection, and we need to figure out how we build on that uh, in terms of building our systems of care around that, because it is about, as I think uh, Mr. Passmore said, you know, how do we improve coordination of care, and how, how do we get that information flowing between patients and the people working on the care team to be sure that we can improve that adherence. So um, I'm really proud to be part of Script Your Future and to uh, have worked, you know, we've uh, been at many events together talking to seniors in particular, uh, but many other groups as well, uh, partnering with pharmacists, partnering with other people to improve uh, medication adherence. And certainly, one of the, as we were looking at how we improve access to care and uh, is about to try to also eliminate health disparities as well as in our community. Um, because, you know, some, I know that as a pediatrician who mainly takes care of children on Medi-Cal or who are uninsured, uh, many times uh, they struggle much more with, uh, because the resources aren't as available in the community. To get to a pharmacy may be more difficult. Uh, the uh, transportation is much more of a problem. Uh, language or even just cultural barriers. And when I say cultural, it's not just that because maybe someone came from a different country. Even, you know, we, we have a culture in our healthcare system. You know, it's a, it's, it's a very, you know, it's part of the mainstream culture. We have a culture in our healthcare. And we have a very, con we've created a system that can be hard to understand if you're not part of the system. And so sometimes those of us who are operating within the system, we're very familiar with it. We're very comfortable with it. And we wonder why other people can't seem to <laughs> make it work for them. But it's very complicated from outside. And particularly for in, in many communities where there may even be distrust of mainstream institutions, and, and rightfully so at times, that, they, that um, helping people be able to get their, to, to understand and, and get their, med, their, their medication, to understand why the medication they're getting, what it's for, what it's supposed to do, being sure that that's communicated in a way that people understand is very important. And in fact, um, in my career, for example, I came, when I came to UC Davis, I set up a program to send our doctors out in the community and partner with neighborhood organizations. And the reason I did that was because I told these future doctors, well, they're doctors, but they're future you know, pediatricians, they're doing the residency, that your patients don't live in the clinic or in the hospital. They live in the community, and you need to understand what's going on in the community. And you need to understand what their lives are like. And we know that from studying social determinants of health, and we're here in Sierra Health Foundation, this foundation promotes that, how important that is, is that we're going to actually improve health. It's about also shaping the social and physical environments which people live. And certainly that also, of course, pertains to what we're talking about here today, Scripture your future. So I'm just uh, very excited that all of you are here today to work together on, on these issues that we're gonna come up with solutions. I'm very interested, we're, we're in my office to partner with you to try to address uh, uh, these issues as well, and whether it's on the policy level or actually in terms of implementation at the district as well, and to be sure that we get everyone, generally get everyone truly access to healthcare, that we work together to improve, really ultimately, our shared goal is to improve everyone's health and optimize everyone's opportunity for good health. So it's a great pleasure to be here with all of you, and I wanna thank you again for your commitment and for you taking the time, not only at this conference, but then beyond, to try to implement the ideas that you hear here and are sharing together. So thank you so very much, thank you. And I would be happy to take a few questions if there's time. I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, no. Okay. Any questions? Yes. I'm sure you have the California Crime Care Coalition. Yeah. In addition to the legislation you saw the governor there, are there areas that we should uh, do the legislation to make it next year that we should start working on, uh, spending time on, uh, that uh, aren't being uh, addressed this year? 
Well, what I would say is, is that um, in some senses, that's for all of you to help figure out and help me figure out. But I also, uh, the other thing I would also say, though, is, is that often people say, well, what's the next bill or what's the next piece of legislation? I've tell you from my experience, just because you pass a bill, it's not over yet, right? Even once the governor signs it, there's the implementation part. And so one of the things I hope people remember is that even as, you know, even if even we hopefully pass these bills, it's also important to work on the implementation part. We need to see what are the health plans doing? Are they developing formularies that people can understand? Is this happening? How, what, how, how is this actually impacting people's lives? You know, what, how, what, is the, what are the different agencies, departments, how are they enforcing this? What are the health plans actually doing, right? And if, there's, if it's necessary to do additional legislation, that's fine. Or sometimes it's weighing in with whether it's different companies or in the state agencies or so forth. And so what's really important is for many of you who are on the ground, who are seeing what's happening on the ground, to, to be able to sh get that information to, uh, to us so we know what's actually happening. And then we can decide, do we need to have additional legislation? Do we need to have a hearing and call the agency up and explain or send a letter? Those types of things are, I think, is as important because we can pass all the legislation we want, but if the legislation isn't being implemented in a way that's actually making a difference in people's lives, then we haven't changed anything. And that's really, I think, what we need to see is what's happening and where, where the roadblocks are. And certainly, again, my office, you know, we've, uh, happy to help, and we've 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 weighed in those ways too. So it's not just about submitting a bill in January, but it's about you know calling you calling departments and finding out what what are they doing to implement the the things that we've already passed in the law or the regulatory process as well. So. Yes. Um, so I think you with California and Health Network. Yes. Thank you so much for your leadership, Dr. Pan. Thank you. Um, as a physician, practicing yes. physician, can you talk about either some best practices that you've experienced as you've worked with your patients or, you know, some of the ways that you've overcome some of the challenges in right. terms of coordinating care and, and again, working with a diverse population, diverse right. um, children as well? So one of the things that uh, actually uh, my office were, were, were trying to start some work on and in partnership actually with there's a Healthy Sacramento Coalition uh, that uh, Sierra Health has been leading as well, uh, sort of an out uh, growth from the ACA and the preventative uh, funding that was there, I said was because Congress kept taking it away, um, is, is thinking about how do we build bridges between particularly um, minority communities and, uh, and more disadvantaged communities and the mainstream healthcare system. And what I mean about that is that uh, actually uh, when I was in training in, 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 in uh, uh, as a pediatrician, uh, we recognize that a lot of times families would come into our clinic, right? You know, we'd talk to them, here's the treatment plan. They're a little intimidated by us, frankly, and sometimes they don't ask all their questions or they don't necessarily share everything, right? Or they're listening to us talk and it doesn't make sense to them, not because they're not smart and they don't understand, because we come from a very different world, right? I, you know, at the end of the clinic, I went home and went to a different neighborhood then actually, frankly, this very, you know, was between two housing projects with a couple of gangs and so forth.